Hello and welcome everybody to edition number five of the TypeScript Berlin Meetup. While this meetup obviously was started in Berlin, we're now able to bring together the global TypeScript community with this online format. My name is Nicholas Burke from the Prisma team. And today we have three amazing speakers and some very special prizes. So our speakers today on the meetup will be Valentin Kononov, who will talk about runtime type safety in TypeScript. Then we'll have Michael Arnaldi, who will give us an introduction to Effect TS, a tool that enables the users to write efficient and testable code. And Machie Shikora will tell us about Elm and TypeScript pattern matching and beyond. And we will be running a quiz throughout the event where you can win prices. And that quiz is working with a tool that's called Slido. And the way how you can participate in the quiz is by either taking the URL that you see on the top, uh, on the bottom right of the screen, slido.com slash TypeScript, and either just type that into your browser. And uh, ideally, you can do that on your phone to take part in the quiz. Or you can just go ahead and scan the QR code. And that will also bring you to that URL where you can then answer the questions that we are going to ask you throughout the meetup. So uh, I'll give you one, two more seconds to scan the URL or uh, type it. And let's go and start with our first uh, question, not yet, but actually talk. Uh, let's talk about the prizes that you can win here. Because for the winners of this quiz, we have prepared a Prisma swag pack that consists of t-shirts and stickers. In fact, it's the same t-shirt that I am wearing right now that you can win if you're the person that is answering all the questions correctly and also is answering fast. Because if multiple people provide the right answers to the questions, then in the end, the winner will will be picked based on who submitted their answers the fastest. All right. Um, another announcement is that all the attendees of this meetup, everybody who's watching right now, can get 20% off the ticket price for the Practical Functional Programming with TypeScript workshop that's hosted by our speaker today, uh, Michael Arnaldi. It is a three-day interactive workshop with a wide range of topics will be covered, mixing theory and practice. You will learn the basics of functional programming, so pure functions, ADTs, EDSLs, and how to use functional effect systems to build modular performant applications that are easy to write and maintain. In this workshop, TypeScript developers will learn how to solve complex problems in asynchronous and concurrent programming using the Effect TS library. The best question asked during the Q&A after Michael's talk will win a free ticket to this workshop. So you have to watch Michael's talk. You have to think about a really good question that you can ask afterwards for the Q&A. And then at the end of the meetup today, Michael is going to pick the favorite question um, that will win a free ticket to this workshop. All right, so let's go ahead and ask the first question via Slido. So this is not for the quiz yet, so it doesn't really matter what you answer, but this is just for us to get a feeling of where folks are joining us from. So you can now submit the city that you're in right now so that we have an overview of who else is watching this stream here today. And I see a couple of folks. So I'm based in Berlin, and so is the majority of the Prisma team. Uh, but it seems like we have folks from all over already. So I see um, Hamburg, I see Paris, I see Warsaw, I see Freiburg, I see Rome. Oh, God, USA. We have people from all over the place. This is awesome to see. 22 people are taking part at least also in this uh, in this fun exercise of getting together. But it seems like the the most people actually are joining us from Berlin, which does make sense ultimately because it is the TypeScript Berlin meetup. All right, I'll give you a couple of more minutes. Uh, where is uh, Saratov? That's a city I don't think I've ever heard of. Uh, maybe you can write that in the comments. Helsinki, Lisboa, Regensburg, Waterloo. All right, we have people from all over. This is super exciting. 
and more coming in. I'm I'm a bit hesitant to already move on because it seems like more are coming in. But I think we can slowly move on to the next slide. So thank you, everybody, for submitting uh, the, the places where you live. Oh, and Saratov is in Russia. All right, let's move on here. So it's time to introduce our first speaker for today, and that's Valentin Kononov. He will tell us about runtime type safety in TypeScript. And Valentin works at Mapbox R&D Center in Minsk, Belarus, and has experience in, among others, TypeScript, JavaScript, .NET, Angular, React, Node.js, Nest.js, so a wide range of technologies. He loves the modern web technical stack, but strongly believes in understanding fundamental aspects of programming. He likes code writing, working on useful, valuable projects, and his spare time is mostly dedicated to his family, reading, writing, and traveling. So, without any further delay, I bring you Valentin. Hi, everybody. Hi, Nicholas, and thanks a lot for such a warm introduction. And actually, I was a guy who entered Saratov here because it's a funny thing. I'm uh, streaming right now from the Saratov from Russia. So, right. I work for a company in Minsk, but uh, right now, for some uh, political and geographical reasons, I am located outside of Belarus right now. So, I see. Fair I'm enough. here. Yeah, it's glad to have you. So I think uh, you can go ahead and share your screen, and then we'll dive into your presentation. I'm super curious sure. to hear about these concepts. And then uh, I'll watch the YouTube chat for any questions that are coming up that we can pick up after <coughs> your talk. Sure. Thanks a lot. And uh, let me start. So just once again, Nicholas and Prisma and Natalie, thanks a lot for Invitation me here. It's an honor to me to be a part of the Berlin TypeScript Meetup. Actually, uh, in the very beginning, when I just started uh, to speak in these kind of events, I really uh, my, my wish was to be a part of pure TypeScript Meetup. And now I, I now I'm here. That's pretty cool. So my name is Valentin. I'm working uh, mostly as a software developer, but I also had uh, experience with the management stuff and a bunch of different interesting stuff. And uh, basically, this talk is uh, kind of my story of uh, how I was uh, uh, developing software uh, in uh, different paradigms, how it was uh, not convenient for me in uh, uh, some moments. So I'll talk about that and how I came to the concept of this runtime type safety, so why it bothers me. If you wanted to know uh, more about myself, uh, read some of my articles or my uh, open source projects, you can go to GitHub Valentin Kononov or kononov.space. So most of the information is here, and my Twitter is also uh, at Valentin Kononov. So before we start, just a couple of uh, general slides about my uh, activities in general. So I'm part of GDG Means community. We also do a meetups uh, for the web, mobile, and cloud technologies. It's a kind of small but very warm community and uh, I'm uh, enjoying being part of it. And a uh, company I'm working in right now is Mapbox. We do we are doing a lot of mapping stuff, the navigation code, um, the map improvement, roads enrichment stuff, and a lot of things like that. And I'm a part of the project which is preparing data for neural networks for the fuser usage for roads enrichments. Very cool stuff. And let me start from the, also with a couple of questions. And the first question would be, why do you work with a TypeScript, not a pure JavaScript? I guess it's a valid question for the TypeScript community. And uh, it will be really cool if you write a couple of words uh, of your answer in the YouTube chat or right here, so anything. So why do you work with a TypeScript, not just a pure JavaScript? I'm asking this because I know a lot of uh, people, developers, and just my friends who enjoy just the JavaScript and hate uh, working with the TypeScript. But my cool talk today is about a different <laughs> perspective on this thing. So it's interesting. What do you think about that? And also, it's very interesting what other languages do you use? So for example, uh, the most uh, uh, not, uh, <laughs> how, how to say, it, not famous language which I tried is a Go language. Maybe it's famous right now, but it was absolutely new for me when I entered Mapbox. It's also interesting. 
And the last one, which is the most important question, what makes you feel safe when you write your code? What is that? So think about it and write these answers to YouTube chat. But we're going. And before we dive in, talking about the types and the TypeScript and stuff, I would like to uh, just remind you uh, how we, everything was started. Because without the JavaScript, we would not have the TypeScript right now. And JavaScript was created in 1995 by Brandon Egg as a part of Netscape Navigator and Sun Microsystems. It was created in a very short period of time, like about two weeks. The first concept was created in, in about two weeks. And the primary target was to add interactivity to HTML. So it was created for designers to bring some life into static web. But it came out like that this saying is uh, kind of famous all over the world. The world's most misunderstood programming language has become the world's most popular programming language. If you go to Stack Overflow researches, I believe that JavaScript would be the first, or maybe the second in some period of time language. And of course, we all remember this kind of JavaScript tricks, like operations with different types would lead to different and sometimes unexpected results. I guess you all know that. I, I, I even wouldn't uh, voice these uh, things at the moment. But my favorite joke uh, when I was, was just a young junior software engineer was this one, like, <laughs> who wants to get a two books, JavaScript for dummies, nine for each, 99 in total. It was just a pretty cool stuff when we learn the JavaScript in my group. But God bless the TypeScript. Right now, we are living in the world where we can have the thing which I missed so much in a JavaScript when we can have the compilation step. And this compilation step was given by a TypeScript. Um, just a little piece of my personal story. I started as a C++ developer, and then I learned C Sharp, and I worked like for years, more than five years, just with a C Sharp uh, development. And it was so hard uh, for me to change that paradigm when I wanted to start the, some web development, when I wanted to start some JavaScript, I couldn't. I spent about a year, maybe more, just trying to convince myself that it's possible, you will do it. <laughs> but only when I tried working with the TypeScript and Angular at that moment, I finally get that feeling that, okay, I know that this code is compiled and I know it's verified, at least on some level. So I can go on. I can move on with that. So the strongly types, strong, strongly typed and static TypeScript, I guess, gives this benefit for a lot of people. Another joke, which was also very popular in the time when I was uh, the young student, like the compilation passing is already a huge result for us. So of course it's a joke, but you know, every joke has a piece of truth. So it's very important. And um, the TypeScript gave for me that feeling of safety, feeling like I'm at home, I guess because of this fact that the creator of the TypeScript is Anders Helsberg, which is also creator of the C Sharp before and the Delphi before and the Borland Pascal before. It's so amazing how much interesting and uh, the industry changing stuff was created by one person. So just a huge piece of appreciation. But it wouldn't be a cool language if it wouldn't, if it, 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 if it doesn't have uh, things which can break it, right? So let's talk about the things which makes the step backward here, right? Let's talk about any. And uh, everyone knows that TypeScript has any keyword as a kind of a backdoor for the JavaScript. Let's take a look to a short, simple example. If everybody knows that, that's awesome, but I will voice it anyway. So imagine the case, you have some object with some name, like name of movies, Game of Thrones, and you wanna, uh, yeah, you wanna show it somewhere in the UI. You have a special function for it, which receives the object and shows something like it toast with a property name, with the value of name property. 
And imagine the case if at some point of time you understood that the word name is not so good for the movie title. It should be a title and you change it. But if you didn't have types, so TypeScript consumes it is any object and it will not give you any error at all. You will just keep working with that. But at some point of time, you will see some undefined in the UI. Maybe QA specialists will find it or maybe even customer. So to prevent it, you should just use interfaces and it will give you that static analysis uh, case. So TypeScript will understand what you are looking for and will warn you if something goes wrong. This is just awesome, very cool. If you just put a mistake, TypeScript compiler will check it for you and uh, will remind you, hey, you should fix it before we go to production. And any is this kind of backdoor when you can escape these compilation steps and compilation checks. And if uh, and, and basically you can even recreate all these JavaScript jokes, all these JavaScript tricks with the TypeScript if you use any. See, you have you, you can have the same, which is not so good. To avoid it, there is a couple of easy stuff. You can just uh, correct your ESLint and your, your TS config files with uh, special flags like no implicit any, no explicit any. And if you do that, which I really encourage you to do in every your project, which I am also have, you will see the warnings. If you use any explicitly or implicitly, compil compiler will tell you, hey, something could be wrong here. This is a point, this is a place where you can have an error. So be aware of it. But not just any can live to that. There are a couple of other cases in the TypeScript which makes you feel not safe in both the compilation step and in runtime. And the first of these things is literal access for the property. So you know that in a TypeScript and JavaScript, you can access the property, not just by uh, construction like dot, some name, but you can also use the string value and uh, the square brackets to access it, to access value. And uh, if you just use a string, there is no verification at all. But you can use the special construction, which is called key off in a TypeScript. And it will give you the safety of compilation verification step. So if you will try to put incorrect constant, which is not a part of actual keys of this object, TypeScript compiler will give you an error that there is no such kind of assignment or assignable parameter. So we're still talking about the static uh, and the static part and what's happening before on time. And closely, and, and uh, uh, finally, we will get to the another point in the runtime. But I wanted to share a couple of other things. So uh, some of you may might heard about the yield construction, which is uh, not so popular, but it's used in some cases for such so-called generator functions or iterator functions. And it's a very tricky thing. Before the TypeScript uh, version 3.6, it didn't have type checks at all. So you could return anything in a yield, like an example, and compiler will not uh, warn you that something is wrong. After TypeScript version, 3.6, you can specify the generic uh, types for this function. And if you will do something wrong, for example, here, I specified that return function is generator and the return value should have type number. And if something goes wrong, like in this example, you will see the compiler error. Just make sure that you use the correct TypeScript version first. And second, that you specify the return type with the generic parameters. This is very important, actually. And um, I also put in this here because of another example. Of course, we're not living in a world where we just have our code. It would be great, but it's not, it's not the case. In, in fact, we can have the dozens of different dependencies in our code. And uh, in our project, we uh, had uh, a couple of cases with dependency to some libraries, for example, Redux Saga. It doesn't matter what this library does. 
but it does matter that um, we used this library with a yield keyword. And uh, this select function which we used uh, for the working with the Redux state here returned any. This is very important that when you use some dependent library which uh, returns any for something, you should specifically uh, set, set up the type for the variable when you get the returned result. Otherwise, your compiler will not have any chance to understand what's going on. It will just have any. So for this case, when select returns me any, I'm specifically putting the interface, the interface definition that I am receiving this uh, task status value, for example. This is very important. And here is the uh, actual code from this uh, library. So just to uh, prove the fact that it returns any. Make sure that when you're using some dependent libraries, you have either types in this library or you specify types on your site. Please help the compiler. That's, this is very cool and important. And the last, uh, the piece of this, the huge long intro, is also about dependencies, uh, but a little bit different type. Uh, we also use the cool and famous Ramda library, uh, which is the library for the functional programming in a JavaScript and TypeScript. And uh, you see the definition of uh, the function which we used. The function is simple, pass or. You uh, specify the pass, and uh, you expect to receive either some default value or the actual value from the object. It's used in some functional programming cases. But take a look to the line of code number four. There is this function expects any as an income. So it means that it will not check that pass which you sent here is correct. And uh, this is the case uh, for the refactoring issue. When you change when you implement this function to access some uh, property of some object, but then you change the interface, this function, and this piece of code will never know that you did it. So to avoid it, we added the special typings for this function. So like, you know, in some libraries, you can add the special uh, d.ts file. So we did the same for this particular library. And we specified that the path is a generic one. So we don't expect just a sequence of strings. We expect sequence of key of something to help the compiler verify this for us. And in this case, we will have uh, compilation issues if something went wrong. So summing up, just to sum up, uh, we talked about any literal property access, pure yield usage, and some other stuff like uh, working with the dependencies uh, and so on and so forth, how we can break our nice and beautiful TypeScript code. We also can have issues with backend and frontend calls when we uh, physically don't have the uh, things to verify that we receive what we expect. So, okay, everything is fine. What I'm talking about? I'm talking about that if even if you make it work right on your local computer and everything is fine, it doesn't make uh, you feel safe when some, someone else will use your library in runtime. Because especially, especially when you write a library, you cannot be sure how this library will be used. And you cannot be sure that uh, the person using it will not give you any object. So. Why is it happening? I, I, I always wonder why is it happening uh, with this code because you have the strongly typed static language. Let's take a look. You can implement a very simple function which has types as an income argument and the return, uh, return result is all, also has type. It's just a multiplication. If you will mess up with argument types in your code, you will receive the compilation error. Everything is absolutely great. But let's take a look to uh, the compilation result. As a result of compilation, you receive a JavaScript and you can easily see that there is no types and there is, and there is no checks. 
And if the consumer of your code will try to break it and to use uh, the some other type or any object, you will not have a chance to, um, to fix it and to make it safe. Is there any solutions? Actually, I would be really glad if uh, someone else will help me with the solutions apart from what I'm talking about. So please write your thoughts or while I'm speaking in uh, the chat of YouTube. Um, first, and the first solution which came to my mind is uh, any kind of validation. So it, this is very cool when you work with the front end and back end the communication, the API, you can just validate your request response. Also, also you can write a lot of tests just to make sure that any corner cases will not break it. And also you can add the manual checks for the most important cases when it's absolutely crucial. Yeah, type guards, cool. Um, I, I continue to think, okay, I, I wanted to have the manual, manual, case, manual check for some special cases. And uh, I have uh, implemented this, like in this example. Uh, so if the type, type of what I'm receiving is not what I'm expecting, I'm throwing an error. This is perfectly work, but uh, I don't want to have this solution all over my code because it will increase the amount of code, I don't know, 10 times. It's, it's not cool. So can it be done so simple that anybody can use it, even my dog? I tried. I imagine that uh, I would like to have a decorator, the really small, simple one without any parameters, which you will be able to put on a function and it will do all the magic. Uh, I, I need to say here that I'm a real, real fan of decorators. I know that it's not a common opinion that decorators in TypeScript is a cool stuff, but I, I'm really fun of it. I, I, I started to work with it in Angular, then in SJS, and I really enjoy this declarative type. Yeah, and this was my dog actually. So come on, let's let's move on. So I tried to implement this kind of decorator. It can look like this. So decorator basically in a TypeScript is just a function which will be called by the TypeScript, actually by the JavaScript code. So we will see a sample a little bit later. Uh, this function receives some arguments like property name, which will be the name of the function uh, which, uh, where you put this decorator. And also it has the important thing, the descriptor, which allows you to get access to initial function, which you wrapped with the decorator. It's a cool stuff because you can do whatever you want with this function. For example, you can override it and you can put any check types code here, and then if everything is fine and types are correct, you can apply this function and just return the result. So let's take a look about the checking types code. This piece of example is huge. So you don't need to read it really through, just take a look on a couple of things. So first of all, if you are using the decorators, you have access in the TypeScript to a special library called reflect, and there is a function get metadata. And this is the metadata for the classes and for the classes uh, uh, parts like functions or fields or anything like that. And you can get access to it in a runtime. So if in a runtime, you can uh, get the list of parameters for this function as you write it in a TypeScript code. So in a JavaScript, you will not you, you not have you, you will not have this uh, types, but if you use decorators, you can have it and you can get it from metadata. And also, of course, you have access to a, a variable called arguments. It's a, just a pure JavaScript variable uh, which gives you an access to current function arguments, and you can just iterate all over it and compare is the actual type equals to what you expect or not. And if not, you can throw an error. Of course, there are some limitations. So you can um, check for some primitive types like number, string, date, uh, and is it object? Yeah, is it array? But uh, you cannot have uh, the checks uh, for the array member types. 
because the just because of limitation of TypeScript get metadata. And um, there are some other limitations. So you can have uh, the checks of the class name, but you don't have the name of interface. So some issues are here uh, just based on, on the nature of this uh, get metadata library. So let's take a look. If you put this decorator for the function in a TypeScript, the final JavaScript after compilation will look like this. So basically, you can literally see what arguments are put in this decorator function. So the JavaScript, uh, the TypeScript compiler will put these uh, arguments for you. So you will not need to bother about it. It will be just in a com compilation stuff. And you can see that expected parameters are list of numbers, two numbers, and the return type is number. And you can see the name of a function. So you have most of instruments, most of tools you need here. To demonstrate the feasibility of this uh, concept and of this idea, I created the small NPM package. It's called TS Stronger Types, and you can download it and try it. And of course, there is an open source code for it with uh, more checks, with some tests, and stuff like that. Of course, as I mentioned, with some potential issues that you physically cannot check the older types, but still. And actually, this logo was uh, drawn by my elder daughter. It's also pretty cool to have such friendly projects. What other options? Uh, while I was speaking, I um, took a look at the comments in the chat, and uh, Sergey Velik mentioned IoTS. And uh, this is the first alternative which I wanted to mention. So thanks, Sergey. Um, IoTS is a cool library uh, which will give you the same safety nearly the same, maybe even better uh, for the runtime. But uh, the limitation uh, for some people uh, would be that you should use the special constructed type types from this library. So you're not allowed to use just uh, the pure classes of a TypeScript and interfaces or stuff like that. So all the safety, all the checks are achieved by using the special classes. So it could be a good choice for the small internal project, for example, which is very important. But if you are writing the library, um, and or maybe you already uh, have the big project, transition to such kind of uh, library might be um, huge work, as far as uh, I think about it. Apart from that, uh, there is another library called Superstruct TS Transformer, which is used to validate your uh, requests or responses. Um, it, it's cool to use, uh, for example, when you write an API and uh, when you have the when you, when you want to have uh, the straightforward way to check that the incoming or outcoming JSON is a correct type, and it has all the needed stuff. And the most uh, important for me and the coolest stuff is uh, the class validators library. It's cool because, uh, as I mentioned, I'm fan of decorators in TypeScript. But not just because of it. It's also a big and important part of the Nest JS framework, which is written on a TypeScript with the decorators. So it's uh, the, uh, the pure vision of how declarative programming should be. So you create a class, and you literally put the, uh, like a comment, this field should be a string, or this field should have minimum value as, as a zero. This field should be email. And when, um, the API received this as a request, and uh, if the validation of incoming request is turned on, all these validations will happen automatically. So you will not see the, uh, the point where this uh, validation is called, but you will have it. It's very cool for some reasons. Um, I think I'm coming to the end of this presentation, and uh, here are some links. So if you wanna, uh, wanted to have this slide, yeah, it might be called class validator. I might have some issues, so sorry for that. So basically, uh, the links for this slide is here. The link for GitHub repository with uh, the my concept is here. Uh, I've also written an article talking about the same, but with a little bit more details about the decorators and a little bit more history diving. Uh, there is also a link here to my site and uh, the npm package. So 
if you try it, please let me know your feedback. You can just uh, post an issue with the feedback, or with the issue, anything you want. I really, I will really appreciate it. And uh, as a conclusion, so the my point of uh, this presentation and the mission of this library is um, to make uh, you think a little bit more about uh, your code as a some kind of uh, life stuff. You not just write it and uh, let it away. You write it and it lives your own life after that. So it functions in runtime. And I really uh, encourage you to think about what happens in a runtime. It's really, really important. So that's why it's also important to make your code predictable and easy to read and to put a lot of tests as, as much as you can. And of course, to use types and validation where, wherever you can. If you use a TypeScript, but you don't use the benefits of types, I don't know, uh, you, you fight with the TypeScript and it, this is not cool. So try to use the benefits of it. it the whole purpose of a TypeScript is to help and uh, to make you feel safe. So the whole purpose of my talk is the same. So feel safe and enjoy your well-written code. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you so much, Valentin. I think that was a really, really insightful talk. At least for me, I have to say, I learned a lot um, when you talked about uh, how decorators actually work under the hood. That was always something um, that I've actually wondered because I've never used them from like a developer perspective uh, and only from a user's perspective. So that was uh, certainly enlightening. All right. Um, I don't think that there were too many um, questions in the chat. Um, one from Enrico is, um, isn't using validators that throw runtime errors in order to avoid runtime errors, lots of hassle for not so much value. What's your take on this, Valentin? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the whole purpose of this library and this idea was uh, to demonstrate the possibility that the TypeScript language and all this stuff can make a step forward uh, to the uh, more strongly typed language, languages like C Sharp, even if in a runtime. Of course, I understand that it's not for every possible case. And uh, if you're just uh, working with the API, of course, you might not need it. For API, you just need to validate the incoming requests uh, and that's it, that is fine. But if you are uh, working on a library which will be used by some other people and you are not responsible for how they will use it and they uh, can mess up with the types, for some specific cases, this may be, uh, I guess, a good idea. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, there is now another question coming in that we still have time for. So I'll just show it. How runtime types errors can still occur if the compilation and the right use of TypeScript should have it covered at build time? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, so even if you uh, covered all your code with the types and everything's fine and compilation passed well, and even if you don't use any, but your code is used by someone else, like it is a library, for example, the consumer of your code can pass you any object or I'll wrap the, some incorrect type typed object with any. And uh, he, will, he or she will receive the, uh, some issues which is unpredictable. So if you want to make your code safe from these cases, you should just check that the types in the runtime when the calls happens are correct. So that was the purpose. Yes, and don't use any. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Valentin, thank you so much for um, this talk. And we'll let you go now and continue with the other talks. But first, we'll enter the quiz question. So it was great having you, Valentin. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. All right, so we are back to our quiz that I had mentioned before. And um, here is how we are going to start. So you now again have time to pull up your phones and join the quiz right here. Um, and um, I think your names are going to just pop up or do I? Ah, yeah, so there they are. So as soon as you register and enter your name into the text field, 
your name is going to pop up here. We need your name for this particular quiz because there is a prize at the end that you can win. It's a Prisma swag pack with this t-shirt and a bunch of stickers and other cool stuff uh, from Prisma. So uh, we need your name to ship it to you afterwards. Uh, if you win, of course. And the way how you win is to answer the questions correctly that are going to follow. These questions have been created by the people that gave the talks. So the next three questions that you're going to see have been created by Valentin. And they'll just check if you listened properly during his talk. So we'll see. Um, and another note about the quiz is that you have to be fast. So the faster you answer a question, um, the, the better it is for you. Because if multiple people will answer all the questions right in the end, then the person who answered also all the questions the fastest overall will actually win. So uh, we have 19 people that have registered so far. I'll give you a couple of more seconds, but I think then we can move on to the first question. So be ready. Uh, the question is just going to appear in the browser where you are currently um, looking at and you just entered in your name. So let's start with the first question. Three, two, one, here we go. What is a TypeScript decorator? Is it a special function? Is it a standard TS class, standard TypeScript class? Or is it a pattern of declarative programming? We have 16 answers already. I believe 21 people submitted their names. So I'll wait another second. 20 responses. One person can not decide. Oh, 22. All right, 23. OK, I guess people just registered after the fact. <laughs> All right, 23 answers. So let's go ahead and see the result. 35% said a special function, 9% a standard types of class, and uh, 57 a pattern of declarative programming. And a special function, of course, is the correct answer if you listened to what Valentin explained in the talk. Let's move on to the next question. Again, remember to be fast. Ah, here's the leaderboard first. So Piatrek answered the question in just five seconds. Um, directly followed by Quang and Aishvarya with seven and eight seconds. But everybody uh, who's here on the leaderboard answered correctly. Let's move on to the next question. Be ready. Here we go. Who implements calls of TypeScript decorators? Is it the developer? Is it the TypeScript compiler? Or is it the JavaScript compiler? Again, we're waiting for answer submissions. The counter in the top right is incrementing. 17, 20 people made up their minds. 21, 23. I think that's exactly, oh, 24. We gain more people with every question. That's nice. All right, let's see results here. 44 say the developer, 40% say the TypeScript compiler, and 16% say it's the JavaScript compiler. And of course, it's the TypeScript compiler. Let's see who got that right. So David B took over the lead uh, from Piatrek with 29 seconds. Um, and Piatrek and David also were the only people that were able to answer both questions correctly so far. So let's see the third one. Be ready. Here we go. What is the way to know the actual function argument types at runtime? There is no way. Reflect metadata and function decorators show it. You can just use console log to print them, or I know types, why do you ask me? We see people submitting. 16 people submitted their answers. 19, 20, count goes up, 21. Before we had 24, I think, in the end. So I'll wait and give everybody their chance to submit. 23. And let's see results. The overwhelming majority picked answer option two, and that, of course, is correct. Very nice. Let's take a look at the leaderboard. And it's Piotrek again, who uh, gained back first, first place here in front of David B, who was still able to answer correctly. So uh, it's an interesting race up there. But on three and four, we have Fredex and Siri, and they both are very low on time so far. So I guess that's good if they want to catch up. 
All right, that was it for, oh, actually, no, this is the last question of the segment. So does the yield operator support types in TypeScript? Again, fast. Yes, no, yes from TypeScript 3.6 and higher. 10 answers, 15 answers, 17 answers, 18 answers, 22, 24. All right, let's see the results. Almost everybody this time again got it correct, or at least the majority of folks knew that it was from TypeScript 3.6 and higher. All right, Piotrek uh, is in the lead. Uh, so let's move on to the next segment. Our next speaker is Michael Arnaldi. He's the host of the Practical uh, Functional Programming with TypeScript workshop that you all get a 20% discount on uh, if you're attending this meetup, by the way. And Michael is passionate about technology and its application in the financial industry and has extensive experience in leading tech projects such as trading engines, AML KYC solutions, and payment systems. And as a technology specialist, he has a strong interest in several areas, such as functional programming, category theory, event sourcing, artificial intelligence, DevOps, and cybersecurity. Today, he will discuss how to write efficient and testable code using some of the modules in EffectTS. And after Michael's talk, we will host a Q&A session where the best question asked will win a free ticket to the functional programming with TypeScript workshop that Michael is hosting. And the winner for that will be announced at the end of the meetup. So be aware, um, watch Michael's talk and think about a good question that you can ask in the end so that you can win a free ticket to his workshop. Without further ado, let's bring Michael to the stage. Thanks, Nick. Pleasure to be here. Hey, Michael. Be invited yeah, to speak. To up here. All right. Um, we are about to enter your talk, but maybe I thought that you could just um, say one or two sentences about the um, workshop that you're going to host so that uh, people already can know what they can expect and are hopefully a bit more motivated to ask good questions. Absolutely. So in, in the workshop, we will basically go through all the basic principles of functional programming. Some of those principles are, in fact, what we speak about today. And uh, in general, we will see what, uh, what is thought to be a practical approach to functional programming. Uh, functional programming, in general, has at least two different interpretations. One focuses on the mathematic side and on the theoretical part, and it is Definitely a very interesting, interesting topic, but when it comes to, to writing applications in that style, uh, it's not so obvious how to, to apply the thing. And also for most developers, the, the, uh, the namings of, uh, of things that are used in the theoretical side don't quite reason if you don't have a mathematical background. Right. And I have a mathematical background, and I can tell you uh, they don't reason uh, with reality, even if you have a mathematical background. So uh, we've done a, a great job of simplifying things, uh, thinking in the optics of applying those principles on the everyday applications that we write. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I ported uh, a whole ecosystem that is uh, Zio in Scala that they have done this job for uh, for the Scala language and I've done that for, for TypeScript. So that's a very funny thing because learning one of the two technologies actually uh, enables you to apply both of the technologies in right. two completely different uh, environments. So that's what we'll talk about in detail in the workshop and very nice. we'll go through practical examples and it's all interactive. So so making functional programming approachable for folks that uh, haven't really been in touch with that. I really, really like that. I'm also a big fan of functional programming. I remember having spent a couple of days with Haskell and it, was, it felt like uh, learning programming all over again. But all right, enough about functional programming, uh, at least for now. Um, let's get started with your talk, Michael. Yes. The uh, stage is yours. Is the screen OK? Good.
So the talk is called, right, testable and efficient code with effect yes. What do we mean by testable code and why the keyword efficient? Usually efficiency and testability are thought uh, like counterposed things. Something is either testable or efficient, but it doesn't have to be uh, that way. Things can be really efficient while being testable if architected properly. So this talk is about to, uh, to share some light on, on how to achieve that. First of all, what, what do we mean by testable code? Testable code is code that is written with testability in mind. So it's code that when it boils down to writing tests, it doesn't present the classical issues that we all, uh, that we all know. Uh, testable code uh, is a broad term and usually encompasses a set of common traits that we can find regardless of the pattern we are using, of the language we are using, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Those traits are modularity, single purpose, explicitness, low coupling, separation of pure and impure code, and simplicity in general is good code. It's easy to write and it's easy to maintain when wrote with purpose. When we write testable code in the wrong way, it's a mess of spaghetti code that doesn't really make sense and impacts efficiency and impacts everything else. Functional programming, we've we spent a few minutes talking about functional programming before, and here I want to highlight some misconceptions about functional programming. Some people are, uh, are saying functional programming is testable. Write functional and your code will be testable. Well, that's false. If you write functional code without testability in mind, it's gonna be as hard as any other paradigm when it comes to, to testing. What functional programming sort of brings together is instead some other traits like the single purpose of functions, the separation between purity and impurity. So functional programming by default has some of those traits, but not all. And, and this talk is gonna be about uh, a design pattern that enables for testability while being purely functional with preservation of efficiency. Uh, we're gonna do that first by hand and at the last part of the, of the talk, I'm gonna introduce the, uh, the effect yes library that I've said before, is a, is a, it contains a port of Zio, uh, that's a Scala library for doing uh, pure functional programming. And it's implemented for TypeScript and in TypeScript. It is extremely efficient. Uh, it uses very low allocation and it's really, really fast. It's generally four times faster than promises. And not that it's important for everyday application, but this is a proof that you can be safe and fast at the same, at the same time. The price to pay is, of course, learning a new paradigm paradigm of programming and be strict about what you do. So let's take a look at an example that most likely everybody here is already saw. It's the very first function that every programmer looks at. It's the hello world function that when it's called, it prints out on screen, uh, hello world, followed by whatever input we provide. So what's wrong with that? It's funny to see that the very first example of a function we see actually contains a lot of wrong things. First of all, uh, it's not even a function. Uh, why it's not a function? It's not a function because as soon as you call the procedure, uh, that's the correct name for, for that thing, uh, as soon as you call the procedure, a side effect is performed and the global state is mutated. People say, yeah, this, is, this doesn't mutate any global variables. That's false. It mutates the state of your screen, the state of the console. That is a global state. So that function is, uh, is not pure. 
So it's not a function in the, in the mathematical sense. The function doesn't return anything meaningful. In fact, if you check the type, the return type of this function, uh, of this procedure, I should say, it's going to be void. And when we have something that returns void, we have no idea if by holding the function, uh, we could have, end up with an exception. And that boils down, uh, in order to, do, to know that, uh, you have to see the implementation. There's no other way around. And when you have to look at the implementation of something to know how it works, to know uh, what's, what's the possible result uh, is going to be, then you, you have problems. I remember the same experience in Golang that I used for quite a while to know if something was actually failing or not. I had every time to open the standard library because everything had the, the error type in, in the return. And, and it's not well typed, so there's, there was no reason, no way to know that up front. Another uh, nasty thing is it uses internally the console uh, dependency. We see here there's a there's a call to, uh, to an external module, and that is completely hidden too. So in order to know that this function is dependent on the console, that uh, another time you have to look at the, at the implementation. All of those things makes testing harder, not impossible, but harder. And if you think this is a very small piece of code in a normal day-to-day -day application that you write, you're going to have thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of lines of code. If all of your code is designed in this way, testing is going to be a thing that you know it's good to do, but you never actually do because it's painful. And because, well, it uh, takes a lot of time when well, it actually should not take a lot of time. It should be very easy. It should actually be much faster to write an automatic test rather than spin up your program and test it manually. It should be incredibly faster, even the first time. So uh, the actual content of the slides is done. And let's start with a little bit of live coding. And we're going to address the issues with, uh, with the, hello, the hello world function. So first of all, we said it's not a function. We have to make it a function. That means we have to make it return some values rather than performing a side effect. The second part is there is no expressivity uh, if the function can fail or not. Uh, we are going to solve that by specifying this in the, in the return type of the function. And the third part is about making the dependency on console explicit. So as we see from here already, each piece of program has three components. It will need some dependencies to run, or not at all. It might fail for some reasons. And in case it doesn't fail, it's going to produce a result of some type. These three parameters, these three elements are very important to keep in mind because they are going to be the key of, the, of this architectural design. So let's take a look at how do we solve in practice the hello world function. So this is uh, you probably want to increase the, the font size a little bit. Of the font order. size, yes. Yeah. Huh. That's definitely too much. Is enough? Oh, battery is running low. Ouch. One second. I'm sorry, but the battery is running low. All right, that's not a problem. I can try to ent uh, entertain the, the, the crowd in the meantime. <laughs> uh, 
It would be uh, uh, no, it wouldn't be funny if your if your computer died right now. So uh, yeah, I don't want to even joke about it, but it looks like you have it under control. The charger is in reach. We had this with one meetup, I think, in the past, where actually the the computer of the host, um, where like the battery died, and unexpected things happened. Unexpected things happened. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you're back. I'll uh, hand the stage back over to you, Michael. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that, but I was running out of battery. So we were saying, uh, "Hello World" function. This is what we start with. There we go. Uh, this is the start. And we said, first of all, we have to make it a function. How do we make it a function? Well, instead of performing the operation directly, we can return a funk of code that, when executed, will perform the actual effect. So in this case, when we have our call, the word Mike, nothing happens. Uh, this is not yet running. And we have from the return type an information that this is a funk of code that basically needs to be invoked in order to uh, run. So whenever we want to run it, we we'll call it, and the effect will run. The first advantage that we've, uh, we've gained, for example, we might write retry combinators or or any other sort of combinators that we, uh, we can think, because this is now not. Uh, if I call this three times, it's going to print three times. I don't have to re-instantiate the inputs every time. And you can imagine if this was a failable function, then uh, I could gain a lot of power, for example, saying, OK, I have this HTTP call. If it failed, retry that up to three times, four times, five times. And that can be done in a separated way from, from the function itself. So the first problem, it's easy to solve. And it's just a matter of returning uh, something. Second part, we said there is no information if that function can fail or not. Well, this is still correct. There is no information here. For that, we can use. Uh, and either data type that for simplicity I'm gonna import it. So the either data type we can see has two options. Uh, it's a union type. Uh, it has the left side which might contain a value or the right side that might contain a value. If I specify that this function shall return neither of never on the left side and of void in the right side. This is a smaller trick, but At this point, we see from the return type directly that when invoked, this function will never fail or will return uh, a value, an empty value. So there is an effect running. We don't have a return value, but it's specified that this can never fail. And you can imagine this is much more declarative compared to uh, just throwing exceptions that are not present in the, in the type system. So what's left here? The, dependency on the on the console. Now, there are various ways to, to address these. One common use case, uh, usage is the, is the cake pattern. So I can say I have a console service. 
And in this service, I have a log function. If taking a string is gonna return the thing that we saw before. This type, you can call it IO, for example. And this is the notation that you will see in, uh, for example, FTTS, if you, if you use FTTS. So we have now a console service interface rather than using the console directly, we can access the console from what is called the cake in the cake pattern. And we can now, we've made this explicit. So from the type, it's clear that this function is going to require a console to run, and it might return. It, well, it has an effect that when it runs, it's either never or, or void. So here we have our call. This time, when we get to actually calling the thing, we have to provide a concrete implementation for this log service. And this is precisely as it was before. This time, uh, it's once we call it again, it's gonna be uh, well. Let's check the return type of this. This is an IO, so we have to call it in order to run it. When we run it, we have our result, which is an either. And if there were any error, they are on the left, either they are on the, on the right. So this is one, one example on how do we solve all the things. Clearly, that's not a so nice approach. It's highly verbose. It, and how will you even compose those things? In order to do hello world, hello world with something else, and in order to compose it with multiple parts of your program, it tends to be highly verbose. And uh, well, it's not so approachable. But in theory, uh, this is an explicit definition of the hello world function. So something that showcases the dependencies, showcases the fact that this function never, never errors, and that it performs uh, an effect when, uh, when it's running. Let's see how we the, uh, the next part. At this point, clearly the function is testable. It's not good looking, as I was saying, um, even worse when we need to combine it with, with other functions. Um, and we would like to better express the dependencies and the failure type in, in an actual single type so the, the things are going to be looking slightly better. The type we are looking for uh, is, we said it contains three, uh, three elements. So this is the first time we see an import on on effect, and let's look at the type definition of effect. The type definition of effect has three parameters: R, which is the 
the dependencies parameters. So the thing that a program requires is a potential error. So things that might fail and has uh, a return type. So these is the three uh, elements that we're gonna uh, use. I say this function is now testable. Why? Uh, clearly, you are delegating uh, the definition of a live console to the very end of your program. Uh, so in your tests, you can use a fake console and you can do whatever uh, whatever assertions you uh, you want by replacing the console. The program is written in a way that's not dependent on a concrete implementation of the console. It's dependent on a uh, on an interface. This is a classical method that we uh, that we encounter many times. Program to an interface, not to a concrete uh, implementation. So how would we do this with an effect. But first of all, we can simplify the code a bit. And we can say that the log function doesn't require anything to run. So it works with an unknown input, doesn't care. It never fails, as we, say, as we said before. We use the never type, and it provides a void uh, result at the end. For that, we create a service tag. A service tag is a way of identifying this specific service in an environment that might have hundreds of services around. And we can make a utility we access the function, we access the, the service from the environment, and we use the service from the environment itself. And if we check now at this type, we will see that this is a function that, when called, will return an effect that, in order to run, requires a console service. It is an environment that has the console service inside. It, ne it never fails, and it will return uh, a void in case of successful execution. So our hello world function and now be refactored by using hello or name, the same story, everything is properly inferred. When we call it, we have an effect that in order to run, so this we might say it's our program. In order to run the program, we can run it to a promise, and we will see from from the type an error, and the error will tell us, look, I cannot find a log function you're missing the console service. It basically says the default environment does not have a console. So you have to give it a console in order to proceed. You can say provide service, console service. Here you have to specify your log function. This is a message. And we say it's an effect, it's a total effect, so a thing that can never fail. And inside here, we call the actual console. And this program uh, is now complete. There is no longer any type error. And when we run it, 
we can just double check that everything is correct. It does print out uh, as expected. How do we compose multiple things? Well, let's say I want to say hi to Mike, I want to say hi to John, I want to say hi to Sam. You can chain those elements. And so on and so forth. So that's composition. They compose really well. If you have different dependencies, they will gonna both be both required. It's the example we are gonna see in five minutes. Or alternatively, you can spoil another feature of TypeScript that we saw before in the previous call. They are called generator functions. The build type is actually always returning any, even if you specify the types. And specifying the types is not uh, is not completely nice. Uh, lucky for us, the generator of a generator is actually well typed. It's a fantastic thing, but uh, it might be uh, looking strange if you saw it, if you didn't saw any any build star before. But anyway, think this syntax just like a sync await. Uh, as you would do with a sync away. It's the same style of programming, but this time the result type is properly inferred. On Sam, and this is still purely functional programming, looking imperative rather than uh, functional composition. We now run it, and we'll see Mike, John, and Sam print it out. I might say, repeat that twice. As I said before, with this paradigm, we can repeat things, we can retry things. And this is going to be repeating twice the, the same story. It's actually three times because it's one execution plus two repetitions. And that's how you use effect in, in basic terms. The next part, clearly it's still everything very well testable because your services are shifted, they are separated, and so on and so forth. The next point is actually to make a little bit more contrived example and we are gonna write a program that generates a random number between zero and one depending on the on the number generated uh, if it's more than half we're gonna print out what we've got if it's less than half we're gonna refuse with a well typed error so first of all as we we've, we've seen here first step to actually declare a random service. The rand function that cannot fail and will return a number. We declare a tag like we've done before. And we declare an access pattern as we saw before. Some service and just invoke the run. Service not random source. There is a random source in TypeScript, so that's the that's the reason why it was not working. This we see it requires a random service. So let's say that our program now wants 
the value, random value, we generate a rand, that's a number, and we say if value is greater than 0 0.5, then this thing is gonna fail. We want a type error at random value. For simplicity, I always advise to make the errors typed. So to specify a discriminator, because when you're gonna have multiple errors, you're gonna end up with a union of potential errors, it's gonna fail for reason A, B, C, D, or D. And having the discriminator uh, makes managing the errors much easier. So we say T dot fail, new, bad random value, value. You can see from the type itself that this is now a failable effect that requires a random, uh, a random service to, to run or can fail for a bad random value. We said if the value is less than, than a half, we want to print out that. And we're going to do uh, like before. We are going to print dot value. And now checking at the type, we are going to have an effect that requires random service and requires console service in order to uh, be performed. We see the error type as previously, and this time it's going to say, yeah, I cannot find the random service inside the default environment. So like before, we have to provide the random service. And as before, it's an effect that can never fail. And return math dot random. random. This is a pseudo number between uh, pseudo random number between uh, zero and one. Let's just remove that and. Let's see if it should either succeed or fail. Or well, the reason it's an unhandled promise rejection that has failed. It's not a nice way to do things. Promises throw exceptions. We can run it to an exit that is a safe exit value. And this can be either a failure or a success, but much more interestingly, we can take a look at uh, there's a special runtime for, for Node.js. That by default links to interruption. So if you shut down the service, all the service or all whatever is going on is gonna be safely interrupted. The library contains uh, structures to do manage resources. You can manage the database connections and, and much more. I have to say the library itself has more than 10,000 different functions and combinators inside it. So that's much more than what we can go on in a, in a small talk like this one. The documentation of Zio is a very nice documentation that showcase all the types that are available. But let's see what this run, uh, run main does. It's gonna be probably you now if it's one and a half. Ah, it's still an error. So we say we ha we have this checked exception. We've got this number and it was not a valid one. 
And then you have a really nice phrase of what's going on. If I click here, you can say point precisely to the thing that went wrong. And if this is enabled in production, when thing fails at scale, it's nice to see that it basically goes over the full, uh, well, it shows the full path and it, it picks precisely the points of failure. So you have nice stack traces. But we don't really like for this to fail a lot. It's a flatty service. So let's say we want to retry. And we retry here, we see it takes a policy that specify what retrying means, specify a schedule. That there is another data type that defines the schedule. And we can say very basically, we want to retry on a recurse 10 times. So this is going to retry up to 11 times, including the, the first invocation. So now, most likely, it's going to succeed. It's out of 10. It's a high probability. And in fact, it is uh, succeeding. But let's say that retrying 10 times is not is not enough uh, for you, or you might want to have some weights between one call and the other, if you're, for example, calling an external API. So you could do an exponential back off. And this is now retrying over an exponential back off. You might say, I want to retry with an exponential back off, but only up to 10 times. Functional programming is nice because it's declarative and composable. So you can build very complex schedules that basically define exactly how you're going to retry things or repeat, uh, repeat something else. So as we see now, this still uh, quick interrupt, Michael. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we We're are running out of time. Uh, uh, close to the uh, end time of the meetup. It's of course not a problem. I just wanted to remind you that um, it uh, like maybe makes sense to like wrap up soon, um, so that we don't go too far over time. I'm just gonna like, the, the last few minutes. I'm gonna write the test for this That's because perfect. it's testable code. Otherwise, it's pointless. So how do we test this? Clearly, there's an invocation. Uh, this is an impure file. You want to separate your actual code from, from the invocation place. So you can test out your program easily while so this is your main file, your actual dependencies and your invocation goes here. And then in the test thing, we can say import. No, it's app main. Should raise for numbers less than 0 0.5. Actually, it's great. It should greater uh, than 0 0.5. It's going to be an asynchronous function because the effect is always asynchronous. It's backed by a fiber execution model. So it handles concurrency and many other uh, things. And let's say, let's actually take our real invocation. We don't want to retry here. We need to import the dependencies. Old service, a random service, and this time we want to 
run the promise of an exit value. So we don't fail stupidly in the test. Clearly, we don't want to print out anything in the console. So we can make string array and just push message here. And we want to test greater than, so 0 0.51 as a random number for test is going to be nice. And we want to assert we are expecting the result to be success actually to be uh, avoid so it's a unit and we are expecting the message it's actually this is should succeed I'm gonna do the raise part later uh, less than 0 0.5 that it should succeed with a unit, and the messages should equal to an array of got 0 0.49, 49. Let's try to run this. It is also compiling, it passes. So this test went well. Let's say uh, number greater should raise pretty much same story. And this time we want to say that the exit is going to be a failure. Not exported precisely. A bad random value, 51. And given I, I'm actually tracing the, the application, I have to say I want untraced execution. Otherwise, I'm going to see as before many. Uh, many other information in the error facility. Let's take a look here. Is this failing? Of course, because I don't have a message given in the failure case. Both tests pass, and we are uh, done with it. We have tested both cases. I have to add, in effect, you're going to find many, many other data types. Providing services one by one might not be a good idea. In general, layers are the thing you want to look at. Like for schedules, they are a specific data type this time to provide environment and to construct environment. So you have a very declarative uh, way, for example, in just from this, instead of doing this, we could say, just gonna take one second. Just taking it from here. Okay, that this is a test console. Uh, test 
random just copying things now have these two layers and you can say provide some layer provides a layer to the given effect and I can say test console together with test under. And you can, of course, have huge trees of interdependent things. Plus, plus, plus. There is one dependent on the other. And many combinators that you will have to learn on how to construct and compose services. But at the end, it's the same story. But now those can live wherever. You can organize the code however you prefer and still have everything uh, testable and working in the, same, uh, in the same way. Well, I've skipped some slides, but the idea is that one. You have many packages in the ecosystem that are all built around those principles. Just to name uh, a few, it's in core, and system is the internal part of core. Here, there are around 35 different uh, data types that are each taking care of some specific aspects. This is like the core, li core library. We have a tracing plugin. That's a compiler plugin that adds the execution trace information to your code. This has no runtime cost because the traces are added at compile time. We extend the TypeScript compiler to do that. And the tracing utils that are used to enable or disable testing in, uh, in live mode, so at runtime. That's the compile time and the runtime part. We saw the node integration. If you're running in node, you want to take care of shutting down things if your service gets interrupted and a number of other, uh, of other things. This does it automatically. Effects are interruptible, so you can kill a running effect, not like promises that when it's, they're running, they're running uh, infinitely, and you cannot stop them. Monocle provides functional lenses. So access to data structures, read and write on data structures. Morphic provides runtime types and type class derivation for things like equal, show, and other uh, type classes. Query is very interesting. And it's going to be the basic of one of the future packages that we're going to make. It's going to be a GraphQL package. Queries for pipelining and batching of queries. It has support for multiple data sources and user-defined queries, so you can be efficient in data fetching across multiple data sources with caching and with all the benefits of never duplicating. So you have batching, pipelining, and everything else. Express is a small wrapper around Express.js in order to build APIs and, and backend services. And the last entry that we have in the ecosystem is printer that is a combinator library to uh, text manipulation, document manipulation, and rendering. And it's really nice. Uh, don't have time to speak about that, but it's definitely a nice thing to take a look at. That's the whole ecosystem for now. We have many more things to come. And as I said, the core package alone contains around about 10,000 different combinators. So the thing is much, much bigger than what I was able to, uh, to show today. Hopefully, in the workshop, we're going to take a look at those aspects in much more details, and we're going to build some live running uh, applications. So thanks, everybody, for having listened to me. And I'm sorry I had to spend five more minutes, but I had my unfortunate battery uh, event before, so I've lost five minutes there.
Michael, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful. And Effect TS looks really, really awesome and really powerful. Uh, and to be fair, I think that was the most uh, powerful Hello World function that I've ever seen in my life. So uh, kudos to that. And it was really well explained. So really nice talk. Thank you. Thanks. And Thank you. Um, for the record, for everybody who's watching, I just want to make sure that you're aware that this course, of uh, that this uh, entire video, of course, will be up on YouTube afterwards. So even if, if you have to drop out at some point, you can, of course, go and watch everything later as well. Um, we don't have time to pick the questions uh, right here on the stream, but there, I think, were four or five questions that have been asked, Michael. So um, while you now go backstage again, um, you can take a look at these questions and let us know who should be the winner of your functional programming workshop ticket. And we'll announce it towards the end of this stream today. So thank you so much for joining us today, Michael. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on with our meetup. Um, oh, I accidentally stopped sharing my screen. I'm just noticing. So let me go back there again. Here is the presentation. All right, uh, pull out your phones again, because here is another question. This time, you know, it's not about speed, but we'll quickly talk about Prisma um, as we are the hosts of this meetup. And we want to take this opportunity to let you know what it is exactly that we're building and also how it relates to TypeScript. So you can now go ahead and um, answer these questions, depending on if they are true for you or not, because that always tells us um, kind of how you became aware of this meetup also in the first place. If you haven't heard about Prisma um, uh, before at all, it probably means that you just found the meetup and are now curious to learn more about Prisma and what we actually do. So it's interesting that the majority of people indeed haven't heard about Prisma at all. So I'm going to um, give a little bit of an overview of what it is that we do here at Prisma. And one thing that I can already tease is that we care a lot about TypeScript, which is, of course, also why we're hosting this meetup. And as a side note, we're also hiring. And we're hiring uh, for uh, TypeScript engineering roles almost all the time. So if you're into uh, TypeScript and if you want to work on exciting uh, modern developer tooling, then you might want to check out our docs page. All right, so it seems that really um, at least half of you haven't heard of Prisma. So let's shed some light on what Prisma actually is. It's an open source ORM for Node.js and TypeScript. ORM stands for Object Relational Mapper, and it's a tool that you're using inside your um, inside your project to talk to a database. So you can use it as a replacement, for example, um, to, to write raw SQL or use a query builder. You can use this high-level abstra abstraction that's called ORM. And that's exactly what Prisma is. And Prisma consists of three main tools. So unlike other ORMs that you might have heard of or have used in the past, such as Type ORM or SQLize, um, we have a somewhat different approach. We are really not very well comparable to these kinds of more traditional ORMs, but we are uh, tackling things from another um, direction. And the three tools that you get by default when you're using Prisma is Prisma Client, which is a database client in Node.js or TypeScript that you can use to send data database queries that has a really nice API. Um, then we have another tool that's called Prisma Migrate. And that's the tool that you can use for your database migrations when you want to migrate your schema. And Prisma Migrate, in fact, has only been released for general availability, so for production usage, only two weeks ago after having undergone a couple of months of battle testing in a preview period. And then finally, there also is Prisma Studio, which is a modern GUI for your database. So it's re a really nice way to view and edit the data inside of your database. All right, um, the core benefits of Prisma, and these are actually very similar to just the core benefits of using TypeScript are higher productivity and increased confidence. Because with Prisma, 
all of your database queries are going to be fully typed. And if you've used TypeORM, for example, in the past, you might know that TypeORM actually doesn't provide such strong type, guarantee, uh, type safety guarantees in a lot of scenarios. And actually, at runtime, there can be a lot of uh, errors that happen with TypeORM that Prisma is going to prevent you from. So we've gone uh, great length to actually make sure that all of your database queries are completely type safe. And if you want to learn about that TypeORM and uh, Prisma comparison, we actually have a comparison page in our documentation that talks about these scenarios where Prisma can provide stronger type safety guarantees um, and uh, explains ex exactly how that works. So I definitely recommend you to check out the Prisma documentation and look out for the TypeScript comparison. Prisma is really designed for uh, application developers that are building APIs, no matter whether that's um, REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, gRPC APIs. As an application developer, you're very likely to always find yourself in the same situations, kind of re uh, rebuilding the same kind of features. For example, filtering, pagination, and sorting are just the, the, the most uh, uh, traditional um, features that you can add to an API, and each API basically needs this. So um, Prisma has a very handy, and again, for fully type safe API for um, um, fulfilling these tasks. And Prisma is really uh, loved by the community and especially the TypeScript support uh, keeps um, being pointed out by folks in our community. So here you see a tweet by Max Stoiber, who is um, the, the creator of the styled components library, a very um, famous uh, CSS library for React. Um, and a lot of people are actually pointing out that they have migrated from TypeORM over to Prisma and uh, the parts uh, that they like specifically about Prisma in comparison. So again, um, the, the call to action for you to head over to our documentation and learn about how Prisma compares to TypeORM if you've been using that in the past. And if you want to learn Prisma, but don't just want to um, go through documentation or you don't know what to work on, there is a Udemy course. It's an end-to-end -end course, so um, a, a full-stack course that is using React on the front end um, and uh, GraphQL and Prisma on the back end. So this is really a um, course that takes you from the very inception of a project uh, to um, deploying it to production. And with this code, end to end mar 30 you can get it entirely for, three, for free in the next three days. And we are also hosting meetups that are just about the Prisma ecosystem and about topics that relate to databases, because that's really uh, the 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 part of the the part of the developer ecosystem that we're really passionate about. And we're always trying to get really nice speakers from the database ecosystem. So the next Prisma meetup is going to happen on uh, April eighth. So I guess that's in uh, one week. And we invite you to join us there as well. And with that, um, ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think you saw these questions already. Um, there are two more questions again for the quiz. So pull out your phones again. Uh, be fast because, uh, again, uh, speed counts towards um, winning the quiz in the end. So here comes the first question about Prisma this time. Which database does Prisma not support? And I just realized that I should have mentioned that, but I didn't. So um, I'm just going to tell you that it's Amazon Redshift. <laughs> so far, we are uh, supporting SQL Server, MySQL, and uh, Postgres. And uh, it wasn't my uh, presenter notes to mention that before. So if you had listened or if you um, uh, ha had used Prisma, you, you probably knew this. But yeah, it's Amazon Redshift. I'm, I'm sorry. This, this was my bad. But the next question, the second one, you can answer because that is something that I mentioned during the short segment talking about Prisma. So Amazon Redshift. And the next one is, which Prisma tool is the most recent to have reached a general availability? Is it Prisma Migrate, Prisma Client, Prisma Cloud, or Prisma Studio? So I'll leave you a couple of more seconds to answer this time. The answer count is incrementing. Let's see, in the first round, in the first quiz question round, we had 
roughly 23, 24 people that submitted their answers. Let's see if we catch all of these again. And also let's see if uh, Piotr and David are still leading the board afterwards. So 16 submissions. I'll give three more seconds. Three, two, one. And let's look at the results. 40% of you were attentive during the segment where I talked about Prisma because, of course, it is Prisma Migrate that has been launched for general availability just two weeks ago. So let's take a look at the leaderboard. And Piotrek is still leading, and David is still following very, very closely. But Piotrek is ahead in terms of time. So you see the speed is indeed important here. All right, let's move on to the last talk for tonight. Uh, let's move on to Maciej, the last speaker of our meetup tonight. Maciej is an old timer and has worked in many stacks and languages in the backend, frontend, and mobile ecosystems. He's currently working as a full stack developer in data art, where he switches between Python and TypeScript. And he will tell us about Elm in TypeScript, pattern matching, and beyond. Let's welcome Maciej to the stage. Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, hey so... Maciej, how are you doing? Are you energized? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be. So <laughs> I hope I hope <laughs> I hope the, my presentation will uh, go well. So it's different from the previous one because I have no slides, but the code. It will be oh, not nice. be live coding. Yeah, but it will be like showcase of the code i have prepared yeah. yes I, so like i'm uh, super curious to learn about that if i'm if i'm not mistaken i think elm uh, was also the inspiration the initial inspiration for the redux library which if we have um, react developers uh, watching this right now um, could be an interesting um, side note about how redux actually came to be it was inspired by this um, uh, unidirectional data flow model that was initially um, inspired by Elm. Uh, so yeah, I'm super excited for your talk, Maciej. And without further ado, I'll just let you go ahead and take the stage. Yeah, so so to, to have some explanation about this Redux thing. So I will not talk totally about the Elm architecture because the Elm architecture was really the inspiration. I will talk like on the language level and I will really focus on on the pattern matching, which is available in Elm. I hope you see my screen because I have one screen. So, <laughs> so if you can like in the comment that I you see the screen. Uh, yeah, so what, what you can see here on the left side, uh, so as I said, it was it will be quite different presentation because on the left side, we'll have TypeScript and on the right side, we'll have Elm. So TypeScript will be like a dog and the Elm will be like a rabbit, which will running from the dog. So why Elm? Uh, Elm is like a purely functional language, uh, which I have occasion to work with like half of the year. So yeah, so outside of many features of Elm, uh, Elm has like great pattern matching feature, and it it is the one thing I am missing in switching to TypeScript now. Uh, so exactly the, the the why I created, let's say, this talk, and why I created a library, which I will talk about, which is really like a pet project more than than the library. It's it's exactly like. The, the fact that I would like to have some something which I felt in Elm, so exactly the pattern matching. So what I will be do, I will be like uh, running the dog, and the rabbit will 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 go away with new like with showing more like revealing more more features of pattern matching in Elm. Uh, so let's start. So. The, the first example when the rabbit is going is really like a simple, totally simple type action, which has like two possibilities. It's all or running or sleeping. So we have two possibilities here and pattern matching in Elm is made in a case of expression. So case of expression looks like we just uh, define on the left uh, element of the of the sum type because this is a sum type because we we sum possible 
elements in this in this type and we we on the right side we are defining what will be result on this uh, on this member of the sum uh, i hope uh, at least for me uh, even if when i was like new for elm for me that kind of code and this kind of pattern matching was like cl clear very much i mean there is no really asking what this code is is doing because uh, of course this is only my opinion but generally uh, for me this like clean code where you see all possible options and the possible results which which we can have uh, so how we can do that in typescript so in typescript like let's start from that the typescript has enum type and we can like express like on the left you see the TypeScript on the right you, you you see the Elm so we can express as an enum this sum type and it's really like the same thing on this level so we can also replace our case case expression by switch statement and that's fine I mean that works this is also readable enough of course we have a lot of syntax more we have return we have more brackets but that's the specification of the language so I will not complain on that but what we can do more so like we we can we can go to the union so we can do the union from strings it's a literal union and we can do the same so we can say union have two members it's a run and slip and we can do the switch over that and the code all, uh, almost look the same so i left the comment like what if i removed one option so the the bad part of this is that if I remove the option, nothing happens. So it means that we are not protected uh, in the type level that we will cover all cases. In Elm, uh, it's like always like there is a protection over that. So we, we need to explicitly uh, put like a w w wild card to, to say that all other options need to have some uh, result so it's it's not possible to just omit some options so here it, it doesn't apply but more or less for this simple sum type we can say that it's is equivalent and it doesn't look very much bad so on this level enum or literal type can replace like a simple not parameterized sum let's say so what what we have uh, next so the the rabbit goes and it's running so it's running to the point where we have where we have parameterized sum so as you can see the type is almost the same but we have like additional argument which is like int and how elm works with that is that in the pattern matching we can really say run and do the destruct uh, the structuring over that and say run distance and just use this distance here so that's that's really fine because i still can enumerate over all options and i can use like arguments in here so still i think still it's my personal opinion that this this code looks very clear so how typescript can deal with that so first try uh is nope because we cannot have parameterized uh enum in, in typescript so this is like compile error so unfortunately it's not the case swift language has exactly that so we we can have an enum which which has a, additional arguments but it's it's not a swift so let's go on what we can do in typescript so let's go in oop away so we can have an action uh, class we can run class which extends action which has a distance and we can have a slip which extends an action so in this way, we can really uh, do quite the same stuff. So we can check if instance of a run is here and we use the distance. As you can see, like TypeScript is uh, is showing that in this uh, if block, the action is really run. So it, it's, it's able to make a type guard over that. So that's fine. But as you can see, a lot of burden is here. I mean, a lot of code. So we don't like that let's go further what we can do more with that so we can make a target union by plain objects so this is a tag uh, which which will be uh, discriminating which option we will use and again we can do the switch over a tag and we can use the distance so still as you can see typescript is able to 
know that in this particular branch of the switch, this is a run tag and it has a distance. So that's that's kind of fine, but it's very, very verbose. And as you can see, the difference is that here, to make an run, we need to, like, it, it's simple as it, that type action has a const value constructor built in. Here, we need to do the raw object. So it doesn't look the same or or similar to that, but it's it's not bad. What we can do more with that is we can change the action into tuple. I mean, this is a like array in JavaScript, but generally we, we can we can make like tag as the first element of the tuple and the argument of the second element of the tuple. So this almost looks the same, but this code maybe is less nice because we use index instead of uh name uh parameter name so that's maybe uh like downside of this approach and still if i will remove this case nothing happens the compiler doesn't protect us but constructor is a little bit better than the previous one because it's less verbose let's say so it's it's simple to create such a such a uh element of this type okay let's let's go further what we can do more uh, we can do a protection over the switch and really remove uh, add this option on default which is using never type and the never means that we cannot assign the action to never so if i will remove one option this will be compile time error but it's fine that we have it and it's it's protect us but Still, when we look on this code and to, to compare that to the right side, it doesn't compare very much because this looks very scary. So we can we can do better, let's say. So what we can do better, I create here some uh, simple uh, match utility type. Um, what we can do here, I mean, I will very fast go through this type. So. We were using we are using sum which which is the tuple which is or just a tag or just a, or tag with an argument and we go over that so this is a mapped type so we say that key is a tag so we go through the tag and if we check that our like our element is like has an arg argument then on the right side we need to have like a function which has argument of this of this type yeah so if not it means that this is like a uh, like a simple element without argument and we have like just a function without an argument and i create like a simple case of function which uses this type i will not go into very much detail but generally the fact is that as you can see this is a simple function which takes like a value on the uh, first argument pattern over this value pattern is really an object which we'll see in a moment. So how we can use it? Uh, in in the following way, we have an action, which is still a tuple, uh, which has two elements, run and sleep. And we have case of which, this is a pattern which we created in the match uh, type. So we have, as you can see, compiler knows what we have here. We have a run and on the right side, we need to have like a function which have a distance argument which is the number and we have a slip which takes a function which has no argument the string is like a result type because all elements of this case of needs to return the same type so now let's check what will happen if i will remove one option yeah so that's that's great behavior because we need to have all options here because this is compile time error so that's fine also and what the compiler really shows us here let's check how compiler help us here as you can see it's nice help because it's saying you have a run which needs to have function from number and you have a slip which needs to have a function to string without argument so it shows all possible options that that's really everything which we could do to have the same behavior on the right side and I'm quite happy from this and I think it's like type is simple, implementation is quite simple and the effect is almost the same. Of course, like JavaScript has more brackets, but that's it how it is. So what can we go further with? Okay, so the rabbit is, is still running <laughs> and running to the to the 
more complicated type. So now we have run with a maybe. So somebody's running, but sometimes we know how how long and sometimes we don't. So maybe treat the maybe as as something uh, which represents nullability with in in such languages like Elm. So what we can do with that in TypeScript? Firstly, we will use our case of which we created. And unfortunately, the type is simple, so we cannot do the flat thing. As you can see, Elm is doing like a flat pattern matching. So I can pattern match over the uh, the top element and nested element in in the same line. So I don't need to have a nesting. With our simple utility, I need to have a nesting. So I have case of and case of. It's nice, but we could be better. So let's try to run and find a better solution. So as I said, I create some pet project. It's on GitHub. And this pet project, create, I created there a match utility, which is more powerful that, than the type which we have seen before. And let's create an action, which will be, again, some type, which have like maybe number as an argument. And let's use a match width. And match width, uh, as you can see, it's like a little bit different because we have two elements of this. Uh, so we have match, action, width, pattern. And so that's because of some readability, maybe. That's also like, let's say, personal choice. So as you can see, I can make here like almost the same way like on the right side. So I can make a nested uh, pattern matching. Yeah, so I say run just and distance. And this is also, as you can see, uh, compiler knows that it should be a number. So this also knows that it should be function to string. And this also should be a function to string. So let's check what will happen if I remove one option. Yeah, that's compiler error. So that's really great. And what? let's see what compiler is helping us here. So I will just, yeah. So as you can see, compiler is showing like, what options do we have? We have run, but if we choose run, we have like maybe number in the argument. So we can do the nested thing as we have done with in the previous example. But we can have run just and run nothing or sleep or wildcard. That's our options. So like fully compiler knows what available options we have. So I think we are also like done here. So this this level is totally achievable in, in TypeScript. And it's, I think, outside of brackets. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, we have like equivalent solutions. But the rabbit will, will go. Sorry for that. Rabbit will, will go further. And one level more. So Elm can like make more levels. So we have like requests which inside have action. So how we pattern match over that still is flat, totally flat in Elm. So I have success run just distance. So only for that, we have this case. For other cases, we say definitely not running. So we, we use the wild card. Uh, that, that's how we can do that in Elm. So still, we have flat pattern matching. Can we do that in the TypeScript? With the utility, uh, which I mentioned before, we can do that. We can uh, make the request. In, as you can see, like representing those target unions uh, as to tuples are very, I mean, for me, very nice syntax for that. I mean, it's it's really uh, less code than, than tag and, and additional properties. And amount of declaration of those types is quite the same. Uh, so how we can do that? As you can see, we can do that. And this is like success run just like like in the right side. So we, we can we can pattern much over that. We have a wildcard also. What will happen if I will remove the wildcard? Yeah, compile error. So we need to have a wildcard or all options here to be sure that it's it's working well. So now what what the compiler will tell me? So all permutations are here in uh, like TypeScript compiler will tell me what options I do have to 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 make it. Yeah. So and will protect me for having like not all options covered. Okay. So I think still left side is equivalent to the right side. It's compile safety. It's readable. I think so. 
there are more brackets, but we need to deal with that. Okay, so the rabbit is will, will running. Okay, so what what can Elm do is also he can pattern match over tuples. So uh, there's a result type. Uh, the result type is typical way of dealing with errors in TypeScript. This is not the full type because really this is either which Michael in the previous presentation said about. So we should have like two, uh, two types here, not one to be fully either, but it's simplified version. Um, what one thing I should mention also, why I uh, using like match with naming and not of case of like Elm has it because case is like a protected word in JavaScript. So I used match with. So to remember match with is used also in OCaml language. So OCaml language has exactly match with name uh, expression. Okay, so going back to our example. So we can pattern match over uh, many elements. So in Elm, it looks like for all OKs, we return this is this is like some implementation which I just created for this. Uh, so let's say our function just for all OKs create a uh, creates a list of those values, and if some of uh, one of those will error, we'll create an empty list. That's just an assumption. How we can do that in in TypeScript? So the match utility allows us to use match with. As you can see, I pass here three elements and I can pattern match over that in the same way. So I can say, OK, 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 uh, x, y, z, x, y, z in the array, and for other cases, empty array. So like totally the same thing we can do here. And what compilers will show here is like all possible permutations of all three options. Uh, yeah. So totally achiev achievable in, in TypeScript. OK, uh, so yeah, so I think the dog and the, <laughs> and the rabbit can agree. Shake hands. They don't have hands yeah. Uh, so show me the code. I mean, very fast. I will not go into detail. But... Uh, do you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> yes, we hear you again. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, because my headphones are like turned off. So I'm I'm here still. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so show me the code for for a moment. So this is like a part of this code. The code looks like that. Yeah. I mean, this is the exactly the type utility, you, uh, the match utility you have seen. I mean, yeah. The the funny fact is that it has no type level. Uh, no, sorry, value level. So it's only type level, but. It, it, it will be much simpler than that. Uh, work in progress. So how it works, it's used like template literals uh, types. And this is exactly the thing which you see on the end. So it checks if our type inside has, again, the same type and inside has, a, again, the same type and goes like three level deep. I mean, we, we could be doing recursive types here, but, uh, but I, I didn't want to have like a solution which will be like a problem for, for the compiler time. So this solution only takes three levels deep into the uh, into uh, the possible option. I think three levels deep is enough for most cases. So if all, so if you can see like, if we have like nested, uh, nested uh, some type to the third level, our object in the end is really like first tag, second tag, and third tag, and the function which is like a argument of the third uh, of the third uh, element of the sum. So, every, every, so the solution is based on uh, uh, lit literal um, templates, uh, string templates on the type level. It's a quite a new feature uh, of TypeScript. So before it was not possible to even do that. Um, so, so as you, as you can see, like the solution is based on the uh, on the mapped types and on the conditional types and on the template uh, uh, literal types of of TypeScript. And somehow it works. I don't fully know how, but <laughs> it works. Okay. So why do I need it? I mean, really. I mean, let's see. Let's see the React example. Uh, okay. So 
the elm will be here, but the, let's focus on the left side. Le left side. So typical case of the React, uh, how we create a React component currently, I mean, many people do, is something like that. So we have some props, error, can be there or not, name can be there or not, loading is true or false. So it's kind of a little bit a mess in terms of the model which this component can represent. So if an error, we return an error. If on loading, return a loading. If there is a name, we show the name. If not, it's anonymous user. It looks maybe clean, but but it's like it has some. I mean, the code defines that the error is more important than the loading, and an error is more important than the name because really the props which we have here allow ha to have error and name and loading. So really the model of the data is wrong and the, the code is fixing the model of the data. So we don't want that. And we can do that like better in the Elm style. So we use the match width. We have like our request, uh, which is success error or loading. And so this is a proper model of this data. And we say, if error, this shows. If success just, we show the name. If success nothing, we show anonymous user. If loading, loading. Yeah, I mean, I think personally this code looks like simple than, than this one. And this is like the current standard, let's say. Yeah, I think more or less that's what I want to show. But yeah, one thing more. Uh, one thing more here, there are like pattern matching proposal stage one currently, and we have tuple record proposal stage two. Why I'm talking about tuple record proposal? Because better to represent those types here as like tuples, uh, like uh, let's say runtime tuples than arrays, because this has like impact that this is really an array which has all functions of array, so it's not a great thing. Uh, so if they will pass the uh, tuple to, to the stage three, it's quite close. This can be impl implemented uh, on the tuple level. Uh, there is also already existing library uh, test pattern, which is a little bit uh, different than, than my approach because I really focus on, uh, on some types. Uh, and this library focus on the like pattern matching of everything. Uh, so really powerful, powerful, but what I wanted to show is like this mix of pattern matching and the sum time together and how we can model the state, model the application behavior, um, like clear state model and what the application does. Uh, yeah, that's that's thing I think I I think from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mache. That was super insightful and really interesting. Um, I'm also a big fan of pattern matching. Actually, I feel like this is a much more elegant and um, just a, a, a much better solution to uh, like a lot of the problems that we uh, typically tackle otherwise as programmers. But I'm a big big fan of that, and it was great to see how um, the, the support of that is in, in Elm and in TypeScript. All right. Uh, thank you, Maciej. We'll thank you very much. Um, talk about your questions next, but uh, I'll let you go. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you again for uh, this awesome talk, Machi. And I'll go ahead and share my screen again. And it's time for the last round of questions uh, for the quiz that we prepared for tonight. Uh, as a quick reminder, you can win a Prisma swag pack with this Prisma t-shirt, the same one that I'm wearing right now, as well as a bunch of very cool and unique Prisma stickers that you can put on your laptop. Um, you have to be fast when answering the questions, and the questions relate to the talk that we just saw. So. Are you ready? Here comes the first question. The action type in the talk was pre representing running and swimming, running and sleeping, running or sleeping. Make up your minds. One of these three answers is correct. Uh, we can see who uh, is submitting, how many people are submitting. 
great feedback from our former speaker, uh, Michael, for my cheese talk in the meantime. And we have 14 people that submitted their answers for this question. In the previous quiz rounds, we had around 20 people who submitted questions, uh, their, their answers. So I'll wait a couple of more seconds. But if there are not more answers that are coming in, let's go ahead and see the results. Here we go. A few of you picked running and sleeping, and the correct answer was running or sleeping. So the and and the or was actually quite relevant here. Let's move on to the next question. Again, you have, oh, let's actually take a quick look at the leaderboard. Piotrek still in the lead. David is still following, uh, but really has to hope that Piotrek was going to fail with at least one question because the time will be fairly difficult to, to catch up there. Half a minute um, is Piotrek uh, ahead of David here. All right, let's move on to the next question. Be ready, here we go. What language has the match with syntax? Is it JavaScript, Java, Elm, OCaml, or Ruzi? And This is a multiple um, answers question. No, is it not? Uh, uh, no, it's one, it's, it's a single answer. It's a single answer. All right, we have 13 people who submitted. Thirteen people. Fourteen people. All right, let's move on to see the results. So 64% picked OCaml and that was the correct answer here. Leaderboard, Piotrek is still leading. Uh, David is still second. Um, I believe that he is caught up a little bit uh, on time here, but both of them have answered all of their questions uh, correctly, but we have Uh, one or two questions left. So let's see what we have next. Be ready. And here we go. What should be used to represent the non-parameterized sum type in TypeScript? There are two correct answers. Please pick both. Yeah, so here you have two answer options that you have to pick. Two people submitted their answers, five. I sure hope that David and Piotrek were one of these already. Nine people submitted, 13. And the two previous questions, we had 14 replies. So I'll ask for the, wait for the last person to maybe also make up their mind again. And seems like we are there. So let's see the results. The correct answers were enum and literal union. And most of you got that correctly. Let's see the leaderboard. Piotrek also did, it get, did get it right. And we have one more question left. Will David be able to take over Piotrek in this last round? Get out your phones and be ready for the last question. What is Elm using for things which can fail? Exceptions, the result type, the maybe type, or Booleans? Seven answers. And nine answers. Let's see if we can get up to this 13 again from the previous question. There we are, 13. Is it going to be 14 from the first couple of ones? I don't think so. Three, two, ah, 14. All right, let's see the results. You couldn't really decide between result and maybe here, and the result type is correct. So I think we have a winner. Oh, and both Piotrek and David got the last question wrong. All right, that would have been the chance to, to catch up here, but um, David didn't, didn't use the chance. All right, thank you so much for participating in the quiz. I sure had fun moderating it. Um, and uh, Piotrek, uh, you can reach out to um, us on um, Twitter and I guess on Slack or email. I'll, I'll uh, provide the details in just a second. 
Yeah, the winners of the quiz can contact our event uh, organizer, our event manager, Natalia, who has been pulling the strings here behind the scenes and has all uh, has made all of this possible in the first place. Um, so you can contact her directly via Twitter. Uh, the link is in the YouTube chat or via email. The author, uh, the, 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 the person who wins the ticket for the TypeScript workshop uh, for the TypeScript functional programming workshop from Michael is uh, David B, who was asking about the differences between the Scala API and the TypeScript one. So you get a free ticket for Michael's workshop. Congratulations, David. And you can also get in touch with us through the same channels. And um, to wrap up, you can help us make these meetups even better by answering a few more questions on Slido. Or alternatively, you can rate it on the meetup platform and share your insights there. So we definitely want to make sure that we take your feedback and can improve here. Um, I know one point of improvement. You could have a host that is a little bit better prepared and knows the quiz answers and how he has to ask them. So that's definitely a feedback point that we can take for the next one. But we definitely want to hear uh, more feedback from you. So how would you rate the meetup overall? I'll just wait a couple of seconds so that you have time again to pull out your phones and submit the rating. We have two people that submitted. All right. Um, I guess we'll see the results in the end ourselves anyways. Seems that most of you like the meetup. I'm happy about this, that I don't have to like moderate how there's 100% on just the, 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 the first one here. So that's... That's great to hear. Uh, great to see that you like the meetup, uh, apparently. And uh, let's move on to the next question. How did you find out about this meetup? So if you haven't been aware of Prisma, for example, before, I'm super curious to learn how you actually got here. So folks found out on Twitter uh, directly via the meetup platform. Um, other Slack, Google search. With Slack, I think we are meaning the Prisma Slack. <laughs> That's a nice compliment. <laughs> All right. It seems like most of you found out through some other channels that are not even listed here. So uh, feel free to drop um, that in the YouTube comments as well to let us know how you got here, because we're always interested in learning more about how people are finding out about these meetups. Finally, if you chose other in the previous question, could you specify if you have any other suggestions or insights, we'd love to hear them too. So either uh, you can now write this here uh, or in the YouTube uh, chat, you can also copy it over from the YouTube chat if you already typed it out and then paste it here. Um, all right, it's Natalia. <laughs> I think that also wasn't intentional. All right, I think we can wrap this up. Um, that was the last slide that we had for this presentation. I really enjoyed, I just want to go back to this. Let me just... All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, and I hope to see you at the next TypeScript meetup, at the next GraphQL meetup that we're also hosting, maybe at the next Prisma meetup on April 8th, just next week, uh, to learn more about databases and the Prisma ecosystem. And with that, I'll let you all go and see you next time.